Two announcements. Number one, if you have anything here that you leave in here, remember there's going to be a wedding here, and tomorrow they will be uh, getting things all prepared for the wedding, so don't uh, leave anything here. Otherwise, who knows where it will end up, and you'll have to spend time looking for it. So take your, take your stuff with you, and uh, the wedding is Saturday afternoon. The other thing is uh, Jeff Phipps wanted me to announce that uh, Camp Arete is hosting a summer webinar on July 19th to the 23rd, and the topic is Our Destiny in Christ. And he says, you will learn how God controls history and what specific lessons from our destiny in Christ can be applied to our relationship with him today. So to sign up, go to the Camp Arete home page. So that is our announcement. How shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Jesus prayed to the Father, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Before we get started, we'll have a few moments of silent prayer so that we can make sure that we are in fellowship. A term that is, uh, that uh, brilliantly summarizes the whole idea in the scriptures of walking with the Lord. And it indicates, as, uh, uh, as it states in the Old Testament, if two are not agreed, how can they walk together? And so when the psalmist says, if we regard, that is, if we see iniquity in our heart, that is, if we have sinned, then the Lord will not hear. So that there's obviously a breach that occurs in our uh, intimate rapport with the Lord. And so in order to uh, be restored, all we are to do is to confess, admit, or acknowledge our sin. And that does not, you know, it, never, it doesn't say ask God to forgive you. It just says confess your sin and God will forgive you never says to ask for forgiveness or to apologize or any of the other things that people want to add, including just saying, well, Lord, forgive me for my sins, because that is just not what it says at all. It says to admit your sins, you know, identify them, list them. Don't just get try to make a blanket statement like, oh, well, you know, I'm just sorry for whatever. And um, that's not what it's, what it's talking about. So all we need to do is admit or acknowledge our sin, and God instantly forgives us and then cleanses us from all other sins that we either didn't know were sins or that we forgot to mention. So we'll have a few moments of silent prayer, and then I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, we're so thankful that we have you to not only to come to, but to trust, to rely upon, to depend upon, and into whose hands we commit our lives and the issues that surround us. There is so much going on in the world and in our nation that is hostile to the historic foundations of this nation in the Bible, in uh, biblical truth. And it, is, it never states that it is against the Bible and Christianity and, or Judeo-Christianity, but that's what it's all about. It puts it in terms like Western civilization and white racists and all these other terms, but the focal point in everything is to destroy the biblical foundations of this nation. And Father, we pray that you would just continue to raise up leaders who understand the truth who are not afraid to speak their mind and who will educate and enlighten the population as to what the issues really are and what needs to be done. And above all, we need men and women who will focus on the truth of your word, proclaiming the truth of the gospel. And Father, that is the only hope 
And Father, if we are indeed near the end of the church age, then we know another another agenda in your plan is it in is in place. And we pray that we, as we face these things, may uh, be strengthened by the Holy Spirit, and that we may be a, a worthy ambassador and witness for you. And Father, we pray that as we study these things tonight, that it would continue to increase our confidence in your word. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, open your Bibles to 2 Peter. Briefly, we're going to hop around with some different prophecies as we did last time. And we're going to move from fulfilled messianic prophecy to unfulfilled messianic prophecy. Now, all of this is not just something random that I decided to pull out of thin air, but it ultimately is driving us to what we will come to in verse 10, which introduces the idea of the day of the Lord, which will come. That will be one of the unfulfilled prophecies that uh, that I will address as we lead into this. This is so. In some ways, this serves as sort of an overview and an introduction to what we will be dealing with in the mid part of this next ch chapter. So, just by way of review, three sections, three parts, equivalent to the three chapters in Second Peter. After the salutation, the first part covers the rest of chapter 1. God's will is for us to grow to spiritual maturity. And this is clearly based upon the Word of God, which is emphasized as you come to the uh, last couple of verses in the first chapter. In verse 19, Peter says, and foreshadowing what he will say at the beginning of chapter 3, and so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, because we know this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So he is coming back to that theme of what the prophets have written in the third chapter. And the, the intervening section is a warning about false teachers in chapter 2. And then chapter 3 refutes specific false teaching in light of the future return of Christ. The key idea here, just don't miss this, is that these scoffers are coming along who are asking the question, well, where is the promise of his coming? You say he's going to come back. Well, where is he? Why? Everything just continues the same way. Nothing's changed in millennia. So um, just, why are you, do you think that Jesus is going to come back? And so that's the focal point. So it's taking us to a confirmation of Old Testament prophecy and realizing that a lot of prophecy related to the Messiah is yet to be fulfilled. So we're going to be going through that. I don't know that I'll finish to the point of the day of the Lord tonight, but when I get back, uh, we will get into that and um, have a lot to study as we go forward. The conclusion of 2 Peter is that God instructs us to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. This third chapter, we're in the second, we're just in the second verse. Peter's second reminder is a focus on remembering the words of the prophets that you might, might be mindful or that you might remember the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets. And so there's a distinction, holy prophets first, and then apostle second tells us that he's talking about the Old Testament prophets as he did in, at the end of the first chapter. This is one of Peter's favorite themes. 
we will see other references to it as we go to some of his statements, some of his messages in, uh, in the book of Acts. But in Acts 3.18, which is his second sermon in the book of Acts, he says, But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets. Again, this is echoing the same thought that he had in 121, that prophecy never came by the will of man, but the holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. It's God the Holy Spirit who speaks through the writers of Scripture, that in some way that we don't quite understand, God the Holy Spirit was able to oversee, superintend, govern, control uh, what they wrote, how they wrote it, without interfering with their individual style, their individual vocabulary, background, history, things of that nature. So their personalities come through. It's not dictation, but it is a, the Holy Spirit oversees it so that what is written is without error. Last time, I pointed out a couple of things related to uh, Jewish understanding of the Messiah, and I thought this was worthy of repetition. A quote from Alfred Edersheim, who was a German Jew who was trained to be a rabbi when he came to an understanding of the messianic prophecies in the Old Testament that were fulfilled, that Jesus indeed fulfilled them, and he was indeed the promised and prophesied Messiah of the Old Testament. And in his massive work, uh, it's in a single volume, it's about three inches thick. It's about 1,400 pages, I think, something like that. The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah. Now, in this, it's been broken up in numerous things as two volumes because it's easier to handle. This is from volume two, page 980, so that tells you that there's a lot of pages in Edersheim. Um, he says, uh, in all the passages in the Old Testament that are messianic, uh, come to 456, 75 from the Pentateuch, first five books of the Old Testament, 243 from the prophets, and 138 from the hagiographa. That's the writings. Those are the three divisions of the Old Testament. And that's supported by more than 558 separate quotations of those passages in rabbinical writings. And they understood it. That's the point of Michael Rydelnik's book, uh, The Messianic Hope, is to show that, it, that these passages, going back to the 2nd, 3rd, 4th century writings, were all understood to be messianic. It took 500 years, in some cases 11, 1200 years, for the rabbis to figure out ways to make up new interpretations so they would not have a, an obvious messianic reference to Jesus. But that's a massive amount of material that was prophetic. But not all of it came, it was fulfilled in Christ. And that's one of the questions, if you're talking with somebody knowledgeable from a Jewish background, they'll say, well, what about, if Jesus is the Messiah, what about all the things that, that he didn't do? The Messiah is supposed to do a lot of things. And so one of the ways to demonstrate this is how I've structured what I'm going through. We started last time looking at how Jesus stood up in the synagogue in Nazareth and he read from Isaiah chapter 61, which was the reading for that particular Shabbat. And he did, he, as he read it, he stopped halfway through the second verse in Isaiah 61. And when he finished reading it, we read that he just closed the book, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And he began to say, see, sitting down doesn't mean he went back to his seat in the synagogue and sat down. Sitting down was how rabbis taught. So by sitting down, he's taking the position of the teacher. And so he sat down and he began to say, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. But he doesn't read the whole passage. He only read uh, the 
uh, first part of it down through the first line of verse 2, which shows that that part he was saying is fulfilled, but the rest would not be fulfilled. And what's interesting, and we'll get to this tonight, is how many messianic prophecies in the Old Testament are just like this. They're, they're a long sentence, or maybe two sentences, two or three verses, and there's no indication whatsoever as you read them uh, in, the, in the prophet in the Old Testament that there's a 2,000-year break at least between part of the verse and the other part of the verse. But here we have a clear example from Jesus showing that, that this is how you have to interpret some of these verses because uh, the principle in the Old Testament was that the Messiah would have to come and suffer. The cross had to come before the crown. And the focal point of modern Judaism, the focal point of ancient Judaism, was that they wanted the crown, they wanted the rule, they wanted Jesus to overthrow the uh, political uh, entity of Rome that controlled them so that they could have uh, independence without dealing with sin. So we looked at several prophecies and their fulfillment. Genesis 3.15, it would be the seed of the woman indicating a truly human savior. And the seed of the woman indicates something distinctive and unique about this particular book, uh, birth, because seed refers to a man produces the seed, the sperm of the woman produces the ovum, the egg. And so this is a very odd way of speaking about it. It's fulfilled in Galatians 4.4. 4. The prophecy that he would be born of a virgin in Isaiah 7.14 and its fulfillment in Matthew 1.18, uh, 24, and 25. A lot, as I pointed out, there's a lot of discussion and debate over the meaning of the Hebrew word used there for virgin Alma, and yet when you analyze the data, it is clear that it refers to a young woman of marriageable age who has not been with a man. Uh, the prophecy that he would be called the Son of God, this is seen in Psalm 2-7, and the fulfillment is seen in Matthew chapter 3, verse 17, as the Father spoke from heaven at the baptism uh, when John the Baptist or John the baptizer, uh, baptized Jesus. Uh, the Father spoke from heaven, audible, your little MP3 recorder or your recorder on your iPhone would have recorded his voice. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I always point that out because Liberals have come along, they try to make all these things. Well, they just imagined it. It was just a voice in their head. It was, they make everything totally subjective, but it is not. It is objective. Everybody there would have heard the voice of God, just as they did at the base of Mount Sinai. Then we saw that in Genesis 49.10, there is the prophecy that the ruler will be from the tribe of Judah. Now, I wanted to add something here. I didn't get a question on it, but I expected I would. Somebody may have thought of it. In Genesis 49.10, the scripture usually reads, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes. And you, people have thought for many years that, as it was translated in the King James Version, that Shiloh is a name or title for Christ. But there, you get into a lot of technicalities in the Hebrew, which I'm not going to get into, but it, it depends on how you put the vowel points and a couple of other problem, uh, details in there. And it, it looks very much like, the if you change things around, it's very much like the Hebrew in Ezekiel 21-27 which is a prophecy of the, of the future uh, collapse, defeat of Israel, overthrown, overthrown, I will make it overthrown, God is saying, related to the judgment coming from Nebuchadnezzar. It shall be no longer until 
he whose until he comes whose right it is and the if you cha- change the vowel points and just look at the consonants and and uh, break the words down in slight remember there's no spaces between words that everything just ran together and so then you see it as an echo uh, or Ezekiel 21, 27 is an echo of that phrase. In the note on this, the translation note on this, in the NET Bible, they comment that the Hebrew word Shiloh is a major interpretive problem. There are at least four major options. I'm not going to go through all of them. And then they say, with many other variations and less likely alternatives. Some prefer to leave the text as it is, reading Shiloh and understanding it to be the place where the ark rested for a while at the time of the judges. Second, by repointing, what they mean by that is by using different vowels. Vowels are indicated by dots and a couple of horizontal or vertical lines. And says, by repointing the text, others arrive at the translation until the or until his ruler comes, which is a reference to a Davidic ruler or the Messiah. And um, one view is that it could be tra- uh, translated until tribute is brought to him. And then uh, the fourth view is uh, that until he comes to whose right it is or to whom it belongs, which is found in the NET translation the RSV, the NIV, and uh, it's based on ancient versions and translations. So it makes more sense that way. And so this is a messianic prophecy that the ruler will come from Judah until the one who, to whom it belongs, to whom the kingdom belongs, the one whose right it is to be the eternal king comes. And that would, of course, end with, the, with Jesus. The fulfillment is seen in Luke 3, 23 and 33, which is the long genealogy there in Luke, ending with showing that Jesus' genealogy goes back to the tribe of Judah. And then I looked at, uh, I think the last thing we covered last time was that he would come from the house of David, the lineage of David, because this, of course, fulfills the covenant God made with David in 2 Samuel chapter 7. And so Jeremiah 23, 5, and a number, really a number of other passages in Isaiah and Jeremiah refer to this branch that comes from the stump of Jesse, Jesse is David's father. And so here it is stated that I will raise up to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper. This is a restatement that God is going to fulfill his promise to David that the king is going to come from the line of of David. And that, again, is fulfilled in the genealogy scene in Luke 3, uh, 23 and 31, which traces him to David by way of David's son, Nathan. Not through Solomon, but through, through Nathan. And then we have a prophecy in, um, about the location of the birth. And this is one that all of us, I'm sure, are fairly familiar with. That when, G- G- when Jesus was born, and Matthew tells us in Matthew 2 that the Magi, that is those uh, Parthian wise men, they were Parthian uh, from a particular tribe of the Persians the, in terms of their ancient lineage, and that they were involved in Parthia in selecting the heir to the throne whenever a king died. So they were Parthian kingmakers. They were they had a tradition that went back to the time of Daniel. So they were familiar with Daniel's prophecy of the seventy weeks, the chronology for the coming of the Messiah. They knew what that was, 
And we'll look at that before we're done this evening. And so they had been watching. There were believers among these Parthians down through the generations from Daniel's time, which was in the, uh, from the period from about 590 to, 5, to the 530. So in the middle of the 6th century was when Daniel lived. And so they were familiar with that prophecy. And when they showed up at Herod's uh, palace, knocking on his door and saying, We've, we're looking for the king of the Jews, and we, we've seen his star in the sky indicating his birth, uh, that really, really scared Herod to death. He was paranoid already, but here are these Parthian kingmakers showing up, knocking on his door, looking for the king of the Jews, and it wasn't Herod. And so he called in the scribes to say, well, where's this Messiah supposed to be born? And they quote from Micah 5.2, but you Bethlehem Ephrata. Now, Ephrath was one of the uh, founders of the city of this city of Bethlehem. There was apparently another city called Bethlehem in the north. And so this distinguishes it. Uh, you, may, you may have another city somewhere in this country named uh, Houston, but if it's Houston, Texas, you know it's this one and it's not the other one. Uh, so that's, that's important. So that's why you have that second term there. And it says, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, and let me tell you, Bethlehem wasn't very large at all at that time. And... Uh, the prophecy says, yet out of you shall come forth to me, me referring to God, this is God speaking, the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old, and a way of talking about eternity past, that he isn't just some, he wasn't just born there with that finite beginning, he is from everlasting, he is eternal. And that fulfillment is stated in Matthew chapter 2, verse 1, when the scribes come, they quote from uh, Micah 5, 2, and of course Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea. Judea is the, the, it's the Greek form of Judah, which was the, this was the tribal allotment for the tribe of Judah, and this is David's hometown, so it fulfills all of those prophecies related to uh, the birthplace and the family of David and the tribe of, of Judah. Then the eighth passage is Deuteronomy 18.18. 18. And this is an important passage that uh, says that there will be a prophet like Moses. Uh, Moses was distinctive in that he was not only the prophet, but he was the lawgiver. And he was from the tribe of Levi. So he could have been, uh, had a function as a priest, although the headship for the priestly line was going to go to, uh, to, Le uh, to his brother Aaron. But in Deuteronomy 18.18, God, speaking through Moses, says, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren. Remember, Jesus is going to be prophet, priest, and king. And so Moses is distinctive as a prophet because he's a prophet. He's from the priestly line of, of Levi, and he's the lawgiver. He's functioning as the ruler. And so this distinguishes the Messiah to be like Moses. And it's fulfilled in Matthew 2, 11, where the multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet. And by using the article, they are, they're making a statement that, he, that connects him to the, this prophecy. And then when Jesus is talking to the woman at the well, uh, at Jacob's well, in... Um, uh, in, where is that, in, um, it's in Shechem, 
Uh, she says, sir, I perceive that you are, and there's no article there. She says, it's the prophet. See, and I've, I've told you this before, that Greeks, the, the function of the article in Greek is different from that in English. In English, if we want to specify something is distinct from anything else, we'll say it's the apple or this apple. But if we just say it is an apple using an, uh, an indefinite article, then it could be any apple. In Greek, there's no indefinite. The article can be used 10 or 11 different ways. And sometimes the absence of the article is, makes the noun more definite than if an article were there. And it emphasizes quality as opposed to distinctiveness. And so this would indicate a qualitative understanding, meaning a understanding that this prophet is a unique one. So she understood, she is at, she's saying, I perceive that you are the prophet, the one that Moses was talking about. So that's fulfilled there, not only there, but over in Acts chapter 3, when Peter is preaching his second, uh, second sermon there, uh, he references this same uh, prophecy from Deuteronomy. And there we read in Acts 3.21, uh, whom heaven must receive until the time of the restoration of all things. And that term, a restoration of all things, is really talking about the coming of the millennial kingdom. Now, that is a fascinating phrase that we're going to have to come back to when we get into this central part of 2 Peter chapter 3, talking about the day of the Lord and what is happening to the earth at that time. Um, because this picks up on the theme of Isaiah 65 and Isaiah 66 which context is speaking of the millennial kingdom that when it comes, it is called by Isaiah the new heaven and the new earth. You didn't know that. You just thought that was Revelation 21. But we're going to have to investigate this because the only time Peter would know of the phrase the new heaven and the new earth from Scripture would be from Isaiah 65 and Isaiah 66, which is not, uh, it's not used anywhere else. And so the Old Testament has locked that meaning down to describe the restitution, the restoration of the planet at the time of the second coming. At least that's what it seems to be saying. So there's a lot that goes into that, and we're going to probably spend at least two or three weeks just investigating it because there's a lot of discussion and debate over that. And so the time, he calls the millennium the time of the restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. And then he quotes from the passage in Deuteronomy, Moses truly said to the fathers, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. So he, he, Peter is applying Deuteronomy 18 to Acts chapter 3. Now a ninth prophecy is that the Messiah would be betrayed by a friend. This is clearly stated in Psalm 41.9, which reads, Even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted. And then the part I underlined is what's quoted in Acts. Who ate my bread has lifted up his heel against me. It's also quoted here in John 13.18. John 13, remember, is when Jesus is observing the Seder meal, the Passover meal, the night before he went to the cross. And he's going to take the bread and he's going to tell Peter, you know, the person I dip this with and, and give it to is the one who's going to betray me. And so he did that later on in the meal and he gave it uh, to Judas. And he says... Um, 
as he's speaking to them, he says, I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Uh, now, I tell you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he. So he's making a prophecy that night that's going to be fulfilled later that night when Judas betrays him to the Romans. And Jesus is saying, I'm telling you this ahead of time so that you will believe me, not for salvation. They're already saved, but that, that this is something else that strengthens their faith in Jesus the Messiah, so that when he's arrested and when he's taken to trial and crucified, that they won't lose heart, which of course they did. And then, but they will be reminded of these things. That was what Jesus promised in the next chapter in John chapter 14. So in Acts 1.16, we read Peter in his day of Pentecost message there to the crowds at the temple said, men and brethren, this scripture, he's just quoted Joel 2, had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David. And then he's, now he references the, um, uh, the psalm related to Ju Judas, by the, which he spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus, for he was numbered with us and obtained a part of this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the wages of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his entrails uh, gushed out. So Peter is identifying uh, Psalm 41 as being fulfilled in Judas. And then there's prophecies. I'm skipping over a lot. There's over 100 prophecies that were fulfilled in the first coming of Jesus, and, and, uh, but these are, I'm just mentioning uh, 11 here. In Psalm 22, 16, the whole psalm is messianic and prophetic of the crucifixion. Psalm 22, 16 states, for dogs have surrounded me, and dogs was a pejorative word used to describe Gentiles. And the Gentiles, of course, are the Romans when it's fulfilled. For dogs have surrounded me, the congregation of the wicked has enclosed me, they pierced my hands and my feet. At the time David wrote this, which was roughly 1000 BC, crucifixion was not known in the ancient world. It doesn't come into practice until uh, some uh, three or 400 years later with the Assyrians. So this is a prophecy that is fulfilled, Luke 23, 33, they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right, the other on the left. And then the 11th prophecy that I've put in here, Psalm 16, 10, for you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. It's interesting that um, when I started going over to Kiev, one of the first sites that I visited was the Lavra Monastery and the caves where the Orthodox priests uh, would live back when they first uh, uh, were taking the gospel to the Kievan Rus, which was about 1000 AD. And so when... Um, uh, something to do with the lack of humidity inside the caves and the temperature and all of these other things that they would bury uh, these these monks when they died down in the caves and they would be naturally mummified. And so they tr they apply this passage to them. It isn't talking about that because they are they they are corrupted as mummified. This is talking about the fact that the Messiah would not, not see his body go through the normal corruption because he would be raised from the dead. And this is applied in Acts 2.31, um, where again, Peter is saying, he foreseeing this spoke, spoke that is, uh, David spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. 
this Jesus God has raised up in which we are all witnesses. So those are 11 different prophecies. And as I pointed out last time, those who are um, experts in probability have worked out various uh, tools to try to explain uh, the improbability that 10 of these prophecies would come true in one person, that, that for somebody to say these 10 things are going to happen in the future and have all 10 of them happen exactly as said is, is beyond uh, probability. And so there's a book by Peter Stoner, I believe it's called uh, Who Moved the Stone? And he goes into some of these various uh, prophetic details and the, uh, the probabilities. And Josh McDowell quotes from this in his book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And I've sort of modified it a little bit. He uses uh, uh, something else, but I would use the state of Texas, that if you were to cover the state of Texas about three feet deep in silver dollars and mark one with a red X with some nail polish and then bury that somewhere in there, maybe in the Paladura Canyon or or down in the Rio Grande Valley, or out somewhere in one of the many uh, arroyos out in the desert in West Texas, or somewhere up in the Piney Woods. Uh, you can't imagine how huge this state is, and to be blindfolded and just go out there, the chances of you randomly picking that one silver dollar are infinitesimally small to the point that it is considered impossible. And that's only 10, and there's over 100 prophecies that were fulfilled by Jesus in the first coming. Now, the second thing I said we would talk about is some unfulfilled prophecy. And we're going to get to several of them, but one of them, the most significant prophecy, I think, Messianic prophecy, deals with the chronology of when the Messiah would come. And this is the prophecy in Daniel chapter 9. So turn with me. Uh, in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 9. And we're going to look at this prophecy that is just called Daniel's prophecy, his 70-week prophecy, which details the chronology for the uh, birth of Jesus. Now, it's in an important context. And the context, going back to verse 1, takes place in 539 B.C. The Persians have conquered, defeated the, Bab um, the Babylonians, and have established their, uh, their dynasty, dynastic control over Babylon. And in the, we're told in verse 1, in the first year of uh, Darius, the son of Ahasuerus of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books, that would be Old Testament scriptures, the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the um, desolations of Jerusalem, then I set my face toward the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession. He's making confession for the nation as their uh, representative. And said, O Lord, great and awesome God who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments. And he goes on to confess the national sin. So that's important to understand the context because he's reading in Jeremiah. And he comes across the prophecy in Jeremiah that the captivity, that time that the Jews would be out of the land in Babylon would be 70 years and then God would restore them to the land. So that's the context so Daniel wanted information from God in this prayer about the end of the Babylonian captivity. He can count it up, uh, 585 minus 70 would take us to 515. But the 
conquest began actually in 605 with Nebuchadnezzar's first conquest of Jerusalem. He didn't destroy Jerusalem at that time, but that's when he took the first group of captives back to Babylon. And Daniel and Azariah, uh, Mishael, and Hananiah, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were all among those initial captives taken. That's the, 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 um, the execution of the fifth cycle of discipline on Israel didn't happen just in one event. It has three stages, 605, uh, 593, and then in uh, 580, 586. And so from 605, you subtract 70, and you get down to 535. So it's in that time period that you see, we don't know exactly when God starts to count down when he doesn't, but it's right in that time period. And so Daniel in 539 recognizes that the clock's been running and the time's just about up. And so he wants information about uh, the, when this Babylonian captivity uh, is going to end. And so what we learn from this is it's all about Israel. Israel is God's uh, timepiece for all of history. And the subject of this prophecy is Israel. It's not the church. You can't apply this to the church. It doesn't have anything to do with the church. It uses phrases like Daniel for your people. What is decreed for your people and your holy city. And that doesn't mean the church, and it can't mean anything other than literal Jerusalem. And so the passage that Daniel had been reading was in Jeremiah 29, 10. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place. And this whole land shall be a desolation and a horror. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Then it will be when 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, declares the Lord, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans, and I will make it an everlasting desolation. So that's the context. Now, how long is their captivity? 70 years. So th this is the key to understanding this prophecy, that there were these 70 years that they were captive, and now we're going to talk about another 70 periods of seven in Daniel 9, 24 to 27. So I want to read through these passages, and then we're going to break it down. 70 weeks. Now that doesn't mean 70 it doesn't say 70 weeks. It says 70 periods of seven. Okay, so we'll see that if you multiply 70 times seven, that the number is 490. It's not days. It's not weeks. It's years. 70 weeks have been decreed for your people. Who are Daniel's people? The Jews. And your holy city, Jerusalem. And then six things are mentioned that will be completed to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Hasn't happened yet. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Lost a line there. What is seven plus 62? 69. That's short, one short of 70. And then verse 26 says, then after the 62 weeks. So there's a break in the action. After the 62 weeks, so God hit the pause button. The Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The sanctuary is the temple. So the city is going to be destroyed and the sanctuary will be destroyed by this prince 
uh, by the, the people of a prince who is to come. The people are the Romans. Who's the prince who is to come? That's a reference to the Antichrist. So that tells us something about who the people are who will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And its end will come with a flood, even to the end there will be war, desolations are determined. And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. The he is the Antichrist, the prince who is to come. He will make this covenant with the many, that is with Israel, for one week, that is for seven years. See, that's what starts the tribulation. The tribulation doesn't start with the rapture. The tribulation starts with the signing of this treaty between the Antichrist and Israel. That tells you there has to be some sort of governmental entity in existence in the historic land of Israel for there to be someone with whom to sign a treaty. So that would indicate that by the time that the tribulation begins, that there would be a restoration to some degree of a, uh, of a Jewish nation. Now back a hundred years ago, when Clarence Larkin wrote his book on dispensationalism, he, he commented that if the rapture occurred in his day, it might be a hundred years before the tribulation would begin because there has to be a nation of Israel, of course, in uh, the time period of World War I, there was no Jewish nation, and he foresaw that it would take some years. And what I'm bringing out here is between the rapture and the beginning of the tribulation is an unknown period of time. It could be weeks, months, years, decades. We don't know. So he makes the Antichrist makes a firm covenant with the many for one week, but in the middle of the week he will put a stop to sacrifice. So in the middle of the week something happens. And this is what is described really in Revelation chapter 10, 11, and 12. Talk about the events in the middle of the week. He'll put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering, which tells you what? What does that tell you? That tells you that by the middle of the week, there is an operational and functional temple service. Now, it doesn't have to be fully constructed. The re renovation of Herod's, uh, of the temple at the time of Herod was begun uh, long before Jesus was born, and it was never actually completed. I've read some who say, well, it was mostly completed by maybe 48 or 49 but others say even by 70, when it was destroyed, it was not yet quite finished. So that the temple doesn't have to be finished for there to be daily sacrifices. They just have to dedicate the Holy of Holies and the altar so that they can have the sacrifices. So that's what we see is by the midpoint of the tribulation, there's morning sacrifices, there's evening sacrifices, and the, the daily Levitical offerings. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate. Notice this seems to be that he's not uh, fully in power until that midpoint, which I think is what Revelation suggests. Uh, he is building his coalition until that midpoint, and that's when he is going to enter into the temple, and he will declare himself to be a god, and he will desecrate the temple, which is the abomination of desolation, and that's the midpoint of the tribulation. Uh, he'll come and make desolate even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed and poured out on the one who makes desolate. So this is going to be the end of the Antichrist, which comes at the end of the tribulation period. So back to 24 and 25. There's 70 weeks. How long is that? And then uh, what's the uh, time frame here of the issuing of the decree until Messiah the Prince? And then there will be uh, seven weeks and 62 weeks. Okay. So what are the 70 weeks? There's seven 70 units of seven. 
The term weeks is really the Hebrew word shevaim, which means seven. So it's just literally periods of seven. So 70 times seven equals 70 shevuim of years. So that's 490 years. Why 490? It deals with this unity, units of 70 that we see in Scripture. In Leviticus 26, 34, 35, and 43, as a reference to what will happen when the, um, when the Sabbath, the sabbatical years are violated. And that there were 70 times 7 or 490 years of violated sabbatical years. Now, we don't know when those were. They were not necessarily contiguous. But there's a debt now. They have not allowed the land to rest for Oh, for 490 Sabbath years. Leviticus 26, 34 says, Then the land shall enjoy its Sabbath. This is talking about what happens after the fifth cycle of discipline. The land shall enjoy its Sabbaths as long as it lies desolate, and you are in your enemy's land there in Babylon. Then the land shall rest and enjoy its Sabbaths. As long as it lies desolate, it shall rest. For the time it did not rest on your Sabbaths. In other words, you violated it, so now it's going, you're going to make up for it. Second thing we have is the references in Jeremiah 25 and 22 and 29, 10, that it would be a 70-year captivity. And the third thing is that What's in the future are 70 times 7 sabbatical years remaining. So God has a pattern to, that he is following. 490 years of violated Sabbaths in the past, a 70-year captivity, and then 490 years of sabbatical uh, a failure, uh, or sabbatical years rather, in the, in the future. Now, six things are going to be accomplished to finish the transgression. The transgression, Hebrew article there, that's the rebellion of Israel against God. That hasn't completed yet, so that hasn't taken place. It is second, to make an end of sin. That's a reference again to their rebelliousness. That has not taken place yet. To atone for iniquity. That is the completion of dealing with, with the sin issue in Israel to bring in everlasting righteousness. That's what happens after the second coming. Christ will come and he will establish, there will be this restoration and he will establish a everlasting righteousness. Something to note. How long does that period of righteousness last? Everlasting. We talk about the millennium. The thousand years are all, is all with reference to Satan's incarceration and what happens when his in incarceration ends. But everywhere we look in the Old Testament, the kingdom of Christ is eternal. We have to investigate that. Fifth, to seal up vision and prophecy, which means to bring all of these prophecies related to the Messiah to completion. And six, to anoint the most holy place. That would be the millennial, the kingdom temple. Those things, so this schema of these 490 years accomplishes all of these, but not till the end. So none of these are referring to what happens at Golgotha. It's what happens at the second coming. So if the 70 weeks refer to 490 years, all we have to do is find the starting point. So there's four decrees. I'm not going to go through these. The one that fits is the decree of Artaxerxes to Nehemiah, which we can date to March the 5th of 444 B.C. And so that he specifically is told to go back and rebuild the city walls and plaza and moat. 
And what plaza refers to is the marketplaces, and what the walls and the moat refers to is the fortifications. So even though other groups were sent back at other times, they didn't rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Nehemiah does that. So we, our starting point is going to be March 5th. And the ending is going to be when the Messiah is cut off, which we can date to March uh, to after March 30th, A.D. 33. March 30th would be when Jesus entered Jerusalem four days before his crucifixion. So he's cut off after, the text says, after the 483rd year. That's described in Luke 21, 38 to 44. So there's a gap of at least 37 years between the end of the 69th week and the beginning of the 70th week. Now pay attention, how do we get that at least 37 years? Because if you take 70 AD and you subtract the year that Jesus died, which was 33, you end up with 37 years. So there is, when, when the text says that after the 62 weeks, that means that between the end of the 62nd week, this remember it's seven weeks and 62, so it's really the 69th week, the Messiah will be cut off after that, and then the prince will come who will destroy the city and the sanctuary. That's AD 70. But, and then between 926 is all dealing with first century fulfillment, and then 927 hasn't happened yet. And it's been 2,000 years. Okay? So that's, that's the church age. It was not revealed at all in the Old Testament. That's what we studied when we studied in Ephesians on Sunday mornings um, in chapter 3, that this was never before revealed to anyone. So the po focal point of this is the death of the Messiah. He's cut off. It's after the 69th week. It says the Messiah will be cut off. The date of his crucifixion was April 3rd of A.D. 33, and he has nothing. And there's this gap, and in the gap, there is the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, which occurred in August of A.D. 70. It's the 9th of Av, and that year it would have existed, end of July, 1st of August, right in that time period. And I don't have time to go through all the horrible things that have happened to Jews on that date through history. God has a pattern. So we come to the 70th week. One week of years remains. Is it past? See, the preterists say, oh yeah, yeah, that period after the destruction of the temple, that's when the 70th week occurred. So they would say it's fast. So this would say, these people say there's no gap. But we think there's a gap. And so the gap is at least 2,000 years. Now here's our chart. The decree to restore uh, Jerusalem, uh, to restore the people, takes place in March 5th, 444 B.C., to restore Jerusalem. That's Artaxerxes' decree. From that starting point until the Messiah enters into Jerusalem, which is March the 30th of A.D. 33, that's 69 weeks. And that is for Israel. So when we do the math, 70 times 7 is 490 years. We take 69 times 7, and it's 483 years, and we multiply it by 360. Now, the reason we do 360, I'll explain in a minute, but they, they were on a lunar calendar. So it's, it's 12 months of, of uh, 30 days, which is 360-day years. So every few years, they had to really adjust things and throw an extra month in there to get back on track. Otherwise, you were celebrating your spring festivals in the fall. So that's a hundred and that's going to be one hundred and seventy-three thousand eight hundred and eighty days. So Daniel refers to the part of the tribulation, the seventieth week, as a half a week. So that's three and a half. 
And in other passages, he refers to it as a time. That's one. Remember, Hebrew not only has a singular and a plural, it has a dual. So you've got a time, which is one. You use the dual for time, so that's two. And then you have a half a time. One plus two and a half is three and a half. So a half a week is three and a half days, and time times and a half a time is three and a half. So that's three and a half years. Revelation describes it as a period of 1,260 days, and you divide that out, it comes to three and a half years, and which is also 42 months. Three years is 36 months, plus six months, half a year, it's three and a half, uh, three and a half years. So 42 months is 1,260 days. That equals the half a week, the time times, and a half a time. And so that leaves us with uh, a prophetic month being 30 days or 360 days. So if we multiply 69 by 7 uh, by 360, that comes to uh, 173,880 days. And if you do the math from March 5th, 444 B.C., and you add 173,880 days, you end up with March the 30th, A.D. 33, which is when Jesus entered Jerusalem. Now, you can verify that if you take 444 B.C., and you add that to 33, you would get 477, minus one year, because there's no year zero, that ends up with 476 years. 476 years times 365.2421989 days equals 173,855 days. Oops, but then the time from March 5th to March 30th is 25 days. And if you add 25 days to 173,855 days, your total is 173,880 days. So that's what we have. We have to get the 490 years, the first part is 483 years, what happens to the other seven? In Daniel 9.26, after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. The people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary, and its end will come with a flood, even to the end there will be war, desolations are determined. So Messiah the Prince is cut off after March 30th, A.D. 33. Then the temple is destroyed, the city is destroyed in 70. And then there is a gap now, we're still in the gap. And then the coming prince comes at some time in the future, and when he signs a peace treaty with Israel, that will begin the 70th week, which is unfulfilled. So here's another passage where you have part of the way through the passage, it, it splits, and there's a gap that is not, uh, not obvious. So there are a lot of these passages where there's a part of the passage is fulfilled in the first advent, and the other part is fulfilled in the second advent. And all of this has to do with Israel, so this is one reason the church it will be raptured before the tribulation, is that we have no part. It's not part of our tribulation. So Daniel 9.27 presupposes three things. A Roman prince, a Jewish nation that signs the covenant, and a Jewish temple. So these 70 weeks all have to do with the nation of Israel and God's program for the Jews. It does not have anything to do with Christianity. So we'll stop there. When I come back, we'll look at a number of other unfulfilled prophecies and some of these passages that also show this split. I think it's very important to, to grasp that because if you're ever witnessing to someone who's Jewish and they're somewhat knowledgeable about Scripture, and maybe they'll read something uh, that many books have been written on why Jesus couldn't be the Messiah that have been written by, by Jews, it's helpful to point out these passages where uh, Jesus recognized he was fulfilling part of it and the, leaving the rest to a future time, and we see numerous other passages that confirm that kind of a breakdown. 
So we'll look at that in a couple of weeks when I'm back. Father, thank you for this opportunity to look at these passages and to have our, our faith strengthened, confirmed as we look at how reliable these prophecies are and how they came to uh, fulfillment with such precision in Jesus Christ. Father, we pray for us that as we deal with an increasingly hostile world around us and hostile environment that we may be faithful to your word and shine as lights in the midst of a wicked and perverse generation. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.